It's my great pleasure to welcome Tomasz here. Um, we, we met on the biophysics or bioinformatics conference recently in Krakow, and I would like to talk. Uh, Tomasz, Tomasz graduated uh, here at the Aguilon University, then he moved to London where to uh, yeah, where you University you College London. Yeah, and then there you did your PhD and yeah. then moved to California, San Diego to do his postdoc and now he's back at Małopolskie Centrum Technology. Yeah. Still partly in San Diego, that, but yeah. That soon, is correct. <laughs> soon being here or the whole time. And he yeah, he's he's starting his group and working on metagenomics and I'm basically looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. It's, I think it's really important and really good to have a cross-discipline and cross departmental collaborations, and at least, at the very least, an understanding about what's going on uh, around. Um, so the initial, uh, the initial title of the talk that I sent out to you was slightly different from this one, the computational challenges in understanding the structure and function of the microbiome. But I decided to change my talk a little bit to adjust it more to a, to a more interdisciplinary audience and actually give you more information about the context of the research that we're doing. So as Martin already mentioned, I'm right now in the Małopolska Center for, of Biotechnology. Uh, uh, just just across across the street from here, uh, but I'm still part time affiliated with the University of California San Diego, the night lab over there. Um, so similarly to Martin and uh, a bunch of uh, other people, uh, last year I was awarded uh, uh, Polish Returns Grant from Nava to start my own group, and uh, this is what I'm doing. Uh, so you can find my website here or follow me on Twitter. Uh, our main focus is the microbiome and developing methods for understanding the microbiome better uh, so that we can make use of it and take action uh, with regards to the human microbiome especially. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, my uh, students and postdocs uh, are here, so Mary and Pavel and Kashel. So, so um, that, that's, that's great that uh, we're gaining some momentum in, in the work. Um, so let me give you a little bit of introduction about the microbiome and why do we care about it. So the microbiome or the microbiota, but the microbiome is more a more commonly used term, refers to all the microorganisms living in a certain environment. So that refers to mainly bacteria because of technical constraints that we're facing, but also archaea, micro microbial eukaryotes, and other possible microorganisms. And the number of microbes on planet Earth is vast. So in fact, there is more microbes on Earth than there are stars in the observable universe. So this is a huge system that we're dealing with. And there's a huge amount of variety in terms of the microbiome. Uh, but it is not an infinite problem, it is a boundary problem. So if we really consider different estimates as to the size of the microbiome, uh, we're dealing with a, a give around 10 to the 10th number of species. So given the, given the average size of an individual genome, we should be able to store uh, all of the information about all of the different microbes living on planet Earth uh, using 10 to the 16th bytes of storage. Uh, and of course, uh, I don't think I need to give you much context, but this is quite an achievable problem. So, so like right now, oh, this is 2014 data. That was the latest I could find information I could find, but actually Facebook, as of 2014, stored an order of magnitude more data uh, than this problem would entail. Uh, so it is possible, it is very much possible, even though the scale of the problem is huge, it is very much possible to actually uh, store and collect 
and and one day, given enough uh, given enough money and uh, funding from different government agencies, it would be possible to have a Facebook for microbes. Um, but I'm mostly interested in uh, host associated microbes. So, for example, the human microbiome. So, microbes living in and on us. Um, and this is this is a, a classic problem. Like, what what do you see when you look in the mirror? And uh, people can see their hopes and dreams, plans for the day, or something else. Can think about it, but. Um, I've reached that threshold of over three years in the night lab that I actually see an organism that's 43% human. And this is because even though we as humans have around 30 trillion human cells, in fact there are 39 trillion microbial cells living in and on our bodies. So that makes us 43% human from that perspective. Uh, but my background is really in, in chemistry and molecular biology and, and structural biology. So I really like to think about genes and proteins and so on. Uh, so switching to that perspective, there are 20,000 human genes. So that's quite a small set. Uh, still, we've been struggling for years and decades to try and describe and understand this system from, uh, from a biological perspective. 20,000 human genes. Well, there are t between 2 and 20 million microbial genes. So, from a genetic perspective, that makes us 1% human. Uh, and this is, you know, this is an order of magnitude bracket here for microbial genes. And why is that? Well, first of all, it depends on how do we count uh, a unique gene, because this is this is a bit of an open problem. And depending, like, what the exact question is, the count uh, will change and will depend on that. And also, the microbiome is a dynamic system, right? So we've got our own genome that's fixed from birth. It's really difficult to do anything about it. There are new technologies that come around uh, that help us edit genes, for example, but all in all, this is quite a fixed set of genes. But when we think about the microbiome, this is a very dynamic system, right? It depends on our daily habits and depends on what we eat and depends on the time of day. So. This is a vast and a very dynamic ecosystem, but an important one. And if we don't consider it, we neglect 99% of genes that we can change. And to give you some proof that this is a very much um, a dynamic ecosystem, and also like side note, uh, this is a seminar. So if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to ask questions, and then obviously I'm gonna take questions at the end, but if anything's unclear, I'm going too fast, too slow, please uh, let me know. Uh, so here I'm showing you data, uh, a summary from the Human Microbiome Project. So this was a big, big project back in the early 2010s that analyzed, um, analyzed, uh, a couple, uh, couple of hundred people across different body sites. And this shows uh, a summary on the basis of taxonomy of different microbes within the microbiome across different body sites. And really a take home message from this uh, figure is that the microbiome changes a lot between different body sites and between different people. So here, here we can compare stool microbiome. So, you know, we just get poop and then, then we try and see what microbes are there. Uh, it changes quite a lot from person to person, right? So, so there, is, there isn't really something as a, as a kind of a, an ideal or a core or a gold standard human gut microbiome. It changes from person to person and in terms of taxonomy a lot. So what's on the axis here? I mean uh, so here is the proportion, and uh, x-axis are different people, so different okay, subjects. So it's not a it's not number, it's just 
from person to person. Yeah. 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 This is so this is from person to person and this is within uh, within each person across um, across time actually. So this is this is to show that the microbiome is also changing uh, is also changing very significantly in time. Uh, so here again there are those are different body sites and here are different technical replicates coming from the same person. This is the same person across time and this is uh, this is in comparison to other people. So here it's a jacquard similarity. Like I don't really want to get too much into details how this is calculated, but really an important take-home message from this is that microbiome varies across time. So as as we live, as we go about our lives, uh, there are changes to the microbiome, but still we maintain our microbial identity across time. So we are, you know, more similar to ourselves 12 months uh, a, a year in than to other people. So we maintain our microbial identities, we change over time, um, and we have very different microbes across different body sites. So, so it is a complex and this is a very dynamic system. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it's fair to say that, uh, speaking of the gut microbiome, that you know, we harbor almost a garden within our guts. Uh, and, and it's not only uh, a thing to appreciate and a, and a thing to consider uh, uh, from, a, from a purely biological perspective or, or an evolutionary perspective, but it is something that has real consequences. So over the years, and it's really been 10 years or so of more mature microbiome research, uh, we've been able to associate the mi microbiome in the human, mostly gut microbiome, with a lot of health conditions. Uh, so here is a whole long list of different conditions that may be associated with changes in the microbiome. And those are of course, uh, for the most part, associations, correlation studies, right? So people who controlled and robust. Uh, but I think to, to, to appreciate like the, those are correlation studies and those are all types of conditions ranging from you know gastrointestinal issues that we might expect so inflammatory bowel disease uh, uh, ulcerative colitis Crohn's disease uh, obesity uh, going to more uh, to less obvious associations such as with diabetes both type 1 and type 2 mental health there is ample evidence that changes in the gut microbiome may be associated with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, but microbiome changes in the gut microbiome are even responsible for a response to cancer and cancer therapy, or we're now starting to find that there actually is a cancer-specific microbiome, so there we might have access to a new diagnostic tools to help us diagnose and maybe in the future treat cancer better and and really over so, time yeah so here when you say association with microbiome you mean with the proportions in microbiome or some specific bacteria yeah both both usually uh, usually when we talk about the microbiome so it's, so it's not like there are some specific microbial pathogens right like clostridium difficile we know like when you have clostridium difficile like you'll have specific symptoms. But for the most part, it's just, just a change in compositions. There is a change in ecology. This is this all, this whole kind of branch of research has its deep roots in, in my, this microbial ecology, basically. Uh, so I'm not an ecologist by any means, but uh, this is, those are usually more subtle compositional changes that specific clades of bacteria take over or the, the degree of diversity within a certain environment changes and so on. And this may be associated with actually with, uh, yeah. So 
it is very rare in all of these conditions that there is like a specific culprit like okay we need to get rid of this guy or we need to add more of those guys for benefit uh, and so on um, and those are often quite quite complicated uh, quite complicated associations because uh, I mean this is this is more of a side note but right the microbiome is microbiome is uh, region specific so in East Southeast Asia the core microbiome is different than in North America and it is still different that in Central and Eastern Europe uh, and uh, so we need to factor that all of that in uh, when considering certain disease states. For some of those conditions, we actually we have a known established causality. So like with obesity and microbiome, there have been some really nice experiments showing that, well, those kind of microbial signatures may be associated with obesity. Now what happens if we transfer this microbiome in mice to lean mice, like what happens? And it turns out that if we have lean germ-free mice, or so mice that were kept in specific conditions not to have any microbiome, then we, we transfer this obese, so to speak, microbiome into those lean mice, they become fat. So there is a causal relationship between changes in the microbiome and a specific phenotype. Well, this is oftentimes more difficult because in case of obesity, it's quite, quite an easy model. But when we, when we talk about diabetes, when we talk about mental health, there are more you know, difficult relationships to be established. Uh, but the general workflow kind of holds. So first we look for associations. From those associations, we try to establish mechanisms by which microbiome contributes to a certain phenotype. Well, and then the great grand goal is that uh, we, want, uh, we want to design and develop therapies that would act on the microbiome. I don't really know what's the point of this slide right here, but uh, well, <laughs> microbiome harbors a lot of data. So usually the way we learn about the gut microbiome is from a stool sample, right? There, there are many ways, there are many ways to do it. Uh, and uh, ideally we would perform a biopsy, right? So we want to learn about the gut. So we perform an endoscopy uh, and uh, from that experiment we would get kind of an in situ information about uh, the composition of bacteria uh, in a certain and in, in this precise environment. But the problem with with those procedures is that I, I very much doubt that we would have many volunteers to participate and all those different studies, right? We, we need to find, um, we need to find something more scalable and possibly less invasive. And as it turns out, stool and poop, well, it's a very data, data rich uh, medium. Uh, and also, it, it is a very good uh, it is a very good average of, of what is happening in our guts. Uh, so it's easy to collect. Everybody poops, and we can collect it and mass. So we can get a lot of data. And actually, there is a lot of data in our poop. So the way we go about a microbiome experiment. And you know, for the sake of the argument, let's just talk about the human fecal samples. So the human gut microbiome. As uh, we provide people with a swab, so it's basically a Q-tip and a sterile tube, and every every time or at the time that we need to collect the sample, does someone? poops, use the toilet paper, then just puts the swab on a toilet paper uh, to get a little bit of fecal matter on that and this is our source of data about the microbiome. So then what we do with it really to learn about all of those, those things that I already mentioned is that we actually extract the DNA coming from a fecal sample and then we use 
next generation sequencing. So we sequence this DNA and there's just a lot of DNA because so we, what we get in, as an output is basically a, a digital output of, of a lot of A's and T's and G's and C's that corresponds to uh, um, a DNA sequence and, and you know, give or take, depending on a lot of experimental variables, this is uh, from hundreds of megabytes to tens of, of gigabytes of data per sample. And you know, this is our input data uh, for understanding the microbiome. And, and I already showed you some data from the, the Human Microbiome Project. This is what I mentioned. Uh, so the Human Microbiome Project will recap a little bit. It was kind of a human genome project. They published the data on, on the project back in 2001. And it was a huge milestone. It was a huge achievement. A lot of people were talking about this. We were thinking, like, wow, we solved a lot of diseases because now we know of the, all the human genome. So like we will understand how human works. Well, not quite. But then there was a lot of infrastructure on top of that that got developed on top of that project and really uh, especially the NIH, so the National Institutes of Health, the American equivalent of NCN, uh, they were looking how to how to invest this all of this infrastructure into different and in different research. Uh, so what I decided on undertaking was to start investing in the human microbiome research. Uh, so so that's how the human microbiome project came about and, and you know they sampled 250 people across the, all the different 18 body sites, uh, different time points, and they used uh, those are two different techniques. So, so just to give you a, a very brief uh, summary, so, so with shotgun metagenomics, we sequence all of the genes from all of the organisms in a given sample. So this gives us a lot of information, but it is difficult to interpret. Now, the 16S is just a marker gene for bacteria. So we're able to just to sequence just that little gene, and this is kind of our barcode that helps us to identify different microbes. So it is far less information than shotgun metagenomics. But the advantage of this is that it's very much standardized and reproducible, um, and there is little experimental variation. So in the case where we want to have a, a broad survey of the environment, 16S sequencing is actually the way to go, as opposed to shotgun metagenomics, where there is a lot of there is a lot more information, but a lot of ver more variability and a lot more computational challenges that are related to that. And this was really a big, big project that was, you know, the hope, just like the Human Genome Project, like. Okay, we're going to sample a lot of by healthy people by all measures, and uh, then thanks to this, we're gonna we're gonna understand uh, what it what is the healthy human microbiome, right? So we're going to sample a lot of healthy people. We're going to measure them. We're going to do all those different techniques. We're going to spend over 170 million dollars on it. So we're going to understand what is the healthy human microbiome. Um, but I was back in 2012, and here I am uh, talking to you, so, so I, I'm guessing that they didn't really solve the problem. Um, what we learned from the project is that it is very complicated to study the human microbiome, and what we learned from the project that it is very, very variable. And I think it's fair to say that until this day, we don't really understand what it means to have a healthy microbiome and like what is the healthy microbiome. We much better understand what it is an unhealthy microbiome, but like what really this baseline is, is, is much more of a problem. But that was back in 2012. And uh, this, is, this is a plot that if you ever uh, attend a, a metagenomics or a microbiome talk, again, you're going to see a variation of this plot, um, like more or less sure. So it shows a change in the sequencing cost. So basically a change in the cost of obtaining the data 
for metagenomics, right? So how much does it cost to sequence the DNA? Uh, here is a comparison as the Moore's law and the drop in sequencing cost. So it is like the technology is progressing extremely quickly. Uh, but just to spend a little bit more time on this. So back in 2001, that's when the uh, Human Genome Project was finished. So sequencing was still very, very expensive. It was what was called Sanger sequencing. And it was all the way up until 2007 that this was very, a very expensive and laborious process. And in 2007, or between 2007 and 2008, a company called Illumina introduced like a new technology uh, for sequencing and those costs, they dropped dramatically. So, so this is like, this is a cost per, per megabase, I think. So this is like one cent right now per megabase. So it, it, the cost really dropped dramatically thanks to the introduction of technology. And so the Human Microbiome Project was happening like down the slope, so it was still relatively uh, expensive, like probably like three, two orders of magnitude more expensive in terms of pure sequencing and then all the different uh, costs associated with other parts of the experimental procedures also changed. So like as of today, it would cost probably less than $2 million to, con to conduct yet another uh, human microbiome project. And this is actually what was happening. And so, so right now, as, a, as of 20, 2019, we, we have studies of a much, much greater scale. So, so the human microbiome project part two over 30,000 samples. And there is a human gut, uh, the American Gut Project that's being carried out by my parent lab uh, at the University of California, San Diego. We've got over 26,000 samples. And then there's the Earth Microbiome Project that we also uh, did a couple of years back, over 25,000 samples and, and different regional studies coming from different countries that really try and sequence a lot of those local microbiomes so that we get a better idea, like what are the, the local, what is the local variability and how does the microbiome change uh, from region to region. So now we've got really hundreds of thousands of microbiome samples collected and there is, there is a lot of data and the primary goal of this, as I'm saying, is to really to capture the diversity, right? Because we know that the microbiome is very dynamic and it's changing a lot and uh, we first want to understand this diversity, right? Because the take home message from Human Microbiome Project Part 1 back in 2012 is that, well, it's really difficult to know what the healthy microbiome is. Like, we want to capture the diversity amongst humans and within the environment, like, for example, the Earth Microbiome Project. Uh, and actually, we developed in, in, in recent years, it was a long standing project to have a database of uh, different microbiome samples from different places, and it's called Cheetah. Uh, and there's actually a website, at, uh, a web server that anyone can use um, to store, process, and analyze different microbiome data. Uh, and as of today, because I made this credit screenshot today, we've got over half a million different samples in Cheetah. And this is not a uh, European Union or a federal U.S. federal resource. This is a, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a uh, a project that's been developed by a single lab without a grant. Anyway, uh, so we've got half a million samples in a very structured way. There are also other. Uh, public repositories of sequencing data, but we just structure this data in, in, in a way that is easy to, uh, to analyze and, and to uh, compare. And as you can see, all this is centered on North America where we have the highest density, but we actually, now we collect samples from, from a lot of places in America and also in, in Europe. So we're starting to get a very good coverage, yeah. Where's this line in the middle of the ocean? <laughs> right. Uh, so 
This is an actual line, so there was an, uh, an expedition, those are environmental samples. So there was a boat that was going and collecting samples across the ocean from different places. So this is real, what is not real, uh, and I think we rectified this mistake because there are multiple points now over here, was that there was a, a much denser line here in Canada because someone made, and made a mistake and they incremented uh, in the metadata. Because like we, we generate this map from the metadata that people submit and someone just made a mistake in the metadata and was like a very dense line in, uh, in, in Ontario, Canada, but yeah. I guess there's that other diagonal line. Um, <laughs> sort of reading that. One's like that next to the vertical. Oh, this one. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Huh. It's just an accident. I don't, th I don't think it is an accident. Because there is like, so, so a thing to note, and, and I just realized this, but it might be a little bit misleading, because like this metadata is for both hosts associated, so like where humans are from geographically and from like environmental samples so like this those are ocean samples and like probably a lot of those samples around san diego area are like all the different projects that we did on people around san diego area but there'll also be like a lot of different projects and samples collected from uh, you know different soils different plants and so on so it's i i think it's quite yeah, but this is like too perfect, isn't it? Uh, it's too long. My, I really doubt that someone was just like going across the United States collecting all the soil samples or something. Yeah, we'll need to look into that. I think that's a, that's a new thing. Uh, cool. Still, take home message. Half a million different microbiome samples already. Right, and now we're like really investing in those large-scale projects to really sample and survey the microbiome across different environments and different uh, different cultures, uh, different people, different disease conditions. Um, wow, it's been half an hour, and I haven't even gotten to my main point. Anyway, right, developing a lot of bioinformatics tools because like this is a lot of data, it's really complicated. So we're, we're developing like, some very basic computational tools. We're developing infrastructure around, around large scale projects and we're, then we're developing a lot of different packages to help and analyze and understand this data. Uh, and we've got different plot problems that are associated with that. So I've more or less explained to you what is the microbiome and like how do we process the microbiome data that is quite a complex and convoluted project. But really my main, uh, my main goal and my main uh, preoccupation is like how do we understand the microbiome data? How do we transfer our knowledge and understanding of the microbiome data into something that's actionable, right? So as I said, from this like genetic from a more biological perspective. We are 1% human and like, so this is like, there's a lot of microbial genes and there's a lot of variability. Uh, so now let's get a little bit more in the weeds <coughs> with things. And this is one of my grand figures, like coming from structural biology. Structural biology is, is you know, we're trying to understand the structures of different biomolecules, like the proteins. So this way of thinking is very much dictated by my background, right? So think about the human gut microbiome, right? So we have a lot of different microbes in our guts, but then basically we describe each microbe in terms of its genome, so the genetic content of like what sits in the DNA. I mean, obviously it's more complicated than that because biology is complicated and messy, but you know, we need to construct a model. Uh, so then each genome can be split into open reading frames, protein coding sequences. We can find within a genome, we can find regions that encode specific proteins. Uh, and this is where when it starts, getting interesting, right? Because like every protein sequence uniquely determines its three-dimensional structure. 
right? And this is really the key to structural biology. So the sequence determines the structure, and then the structure, because this is how the biology operates, you know, it's this three-dimensional. So within each cell, all the proteins determine their shape, determines their function. And then now as we kind of translate the genome into a, a, a set of different functional potentials, then you know, we can start taking action because then function determine interactions between, between different proteins to form protein interaction networks or between proteins and small molecules like drugs. And this, understanding this, the function and interaction gives us access to therapy. And this is both, uh, this is both classical therapies, designing and developing a small molecule to help change the composition of the microbiome, or uh, more microbiome-oriented uh, therapies such as probiotics, prebiotics. So, you know, all those, all the. Uh, us learning like you need to eat more veggies to have a healthier microbiome like now we've got scientific basis for that uh, okay so this is the major scheme right so microbiome is a collection of different genomes genomes encode different protein sequences each protein sequence determines uniquely a three-dimensional structure that then determines a function and then we can have knowledge about interactions or and possibly design therapies to change the microbiome again. But there's a problem. There is a problem in all of this. Uh, so people have been solving since 1960s, people have been solving experimentally protein structures. And they've been doing a great, a tremendous job in this. There was a lot of Nobel Prizes in, in physics and in chemistry for different techniques related to solving protein structures or solving some specific protein structures. But it's, and those structures are deposited in the protein data bank, the PDB. And it might be a little bit difficult to appreciate this extreme growth and progress achieved in this domain when we look at this plot. And, but this plot compares the number of protein structures compared to pr known protein sequences. So a thing that precedes us uh, learning about the structure. So right now we've got over 100 million known protein uh, sequences. And those are deposited in the Uniprot database, for example. Uh, so both of those worlds experience uh, an exponential growth. The problem is that the exponent is different. So it's not a that break, though. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. I, I'm, I'm get forget this. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, yeah, there, there wasn't like an outage and like we lost the server. <laughs> that's not the case. What actually happened is that Uniprot, uh, they, they made a change in how they store the data. So there was, a little, there was a bit of redundancy in the Uniprot database. And they just, between 2015, from 2015 to 2016, they just decided to deprecate this redundancy and um, not store different, like, because people submit data to Uniprot. And then, so like now each entry gets its unique identifier. And there was a lot of redundancy, so they just decided to merge those identifiers. So that was a huge dip. So yeah, there wasn't any outage or anything like that. The biology didn't go like a year back in time. We just, we just removed, removed redundancy. Still, exponential growth in those both worlds, but with a different exponent. So the gap really between what sequences we know and what structures do we know is growing. And this is really, uh, even more pronounced when we consider some redundancy. Because uh, the basic fact of the matter is that, you know, very similar sequences usually uh, correspond to very similar functions. So the same goes for sequences and the same will go for structures. Uh, and the redundancy in both of those worlds is also kind of different. So, as, so, so, so we have a very significant degree of, 
of redundancy in, in the structural world, not so much, uh, not, not a lot of this redundancy in the, uh, in the sequence world. And there is a very good reason for that, right? So, so there are known proteins, known targets of uh, medical or therapeutic or, or biological relevance. So people try really hard to look at different variations of the structure. They introduce some subtle mutations or they introduce different drugs binding to a protein target and then they try to solve it again and again and again and again. So for some proteins there are, hundred, there are hundreds of different variants of it, whereas for sequences is usually we just we just sequence a lot so we deposit a lot of this data uh, um, so there are very different strategies to that uh, and then moving one step further so right so I covered sequences I covered structures now let me talk a little bit about a function right um, And let me focus just on that, right? So we're, we're, when we look at the human gut microbiome, like how many functions do we actually have reliably annotated in that set? You know, it's, it's been a focus, it's been a huge focus for the last decade or more. Like how much do we know about what those microbes do? Well, not much. We know around roughly 50% of what they do. So even though this is arguably one of the best studied environments to date, we still don't know about 50% of what they do. And here this split, so, so I'll, all this is all the genes of the most prevalent, of the most prevalent gut microbiome microbes. So we know roughly about 50% of their functions. And then we can split all those, all those different microbes uh, into the ones having a core, I'll actually move to this slide, to having a core and accessory genome. Now, for the sake of the seminar, it's not really important what's a core and accessory genome, but what is important is that um, the accessory genome, broadly speaking, is are all the genes that get, like we have E. coli, right? Everyone knows E. coli is like one of the most best known bacteria. Right, it's right here. But there's a lot of different strains. So there's a lot of different E. coli that vary by just a few genes. Still E. coli, but it's a different strain of E. coli. And we've got hundreds of those different strains that just vary by a few genes. But then it actually adds up to a very vast pan genome. So like a set of all, all the different genes belonging to a specific specific species of a microbe. So much so that actually a lot of those pan genomes have, are larger than, uh, than the human genome. So we're dealing with a, with a lot here. So a lot of those different small genes or individual genes or clusters of genes are being exchanged between bacteria uh, and that they contribute to overall very large pan genomes. Uh, Right, and most of it, half of it, is really unannotated and unknown. And uh, how much time have I got? Uh, so, I think, you know, 15 minutes, but that includes questions. Okay, so, so great. Um, and this is where I step in, right, uh, the bioinformatics, so let's use computers to solve a lot of those problems, right, there's a huge gap between sequences and structures, and there is, a, again, a gap between uh, sequences and known functions. We don't know how the microbiome functions, but I hope uh, that I already managed to convince you that it is important, actually, to understand those functions uh, of those different microbes uh, and the repertoire of their genes, because it will help us to design uh, therapeutic strategies. Uh, and so it luckily happens that uh, part of my uh, main part of my PhD was working actually on methods how to predict structures of proteins better just on a computer. Uh, and the strategy generally is as follows. So we have a sequence, and as I already told you, we know that sequence uniquely determines a three-dimensional structure. So 
we're trying to, to solve that puzzle using uh, computers, physics, and our no knowledge of biology. Uh, and because this is a very diff difficult, uh, um, very difficult problem in terms of a very uh, highly dimensional energy landscape, because basically what we want to do is we want to find a free en energy minimum uh, that corresponds to a given sequence. So the conformational space is vast and, and, it's, and it's really hard to sample. So uh, what, what we're doing is we're generating lots of candidate models that are plausible, that are pl plausible solutions to our problem and then from this vast ensemble of models we try to find the lowest energy one that we will say this is our final model. And the way that we were solving it for the time, for the time uh, was uh, uh, a solution that involved grid computing, right? So, so we, have, we have a database of sequences on the server, then we delegate all those individual uh, tasks of folding a sequence into a plausible structure to a lots of, lots of uh, private computers of, of grid participants, and then we aggregate everything and then find the final structure. Great, those methods work really well because we've been working on them for over 30 years. Uh, so we've, we've got a very good idea like how to do this and like how successful those methods are. And uh, we, we kind of expect that around 75% of what we generate is actually accurate. Uh, and through the use of grid computing, we, we've, we've had great success. So we've been running the what's called the Microbiomunity Project with the help of World Community Grid, which is a part of, of IBM. So they were kind enough to provide us with infrastructure to do a lot of those different computations. So we were able to generate over 200,000 models of unique gene families through this project. And well, this, like, is this number impressive or is it not? I, there I say it, it's quite, quite impressive because the PDB, so the, the protein dat data bank that stores all the experimentally solved uh, structures and has been established in real early uh, 1970s, stores, stores around 130,000 uh, different structures. So we've got actually more data than the PDB uh, had amassed throughout the decades. And then when we actually consider the redundancy of those data sets down to like the protein family level, uh, then, the, then on the protein family level, we've got around 30,000 uh, entries. Uh, and uh, so really we cover, we cover much, much more ground with the Microbiome Immunity Project. Still, 200,000 is not 2 million. But uh, we're trying to sample different gene families so that we sample uh, the majority of the space uh, and that we get, you know, through that our computational investment is met uh, with most benefit. And actually, because it's been 47 minutes, I'm going to wrap it with a, a story for you that is around. Uh, protein structure prediction. So going from protein sequence to the protein structure. So what we've been doing for years and uh, what we spend, what we spend 68,000 CPU years uh, of compute on is obsolete. Well, and there you go, I said it. <laughs> um, and is, it is obsolete as of January 2019. Uh, because deep learning, who would have guessed? So, a lot of what we've been doing and why it was so expensive, like 68,000 CPU years to get 200,000 models, is that it was based off of simulation methods, right? So we take a sequence, we use uh, sets, sets of different 
potentials derived from, from physics and biology, and then we try and simulate uh, with small, some small steps the, the behavior of this biomolecule and then try and minimize it um, through gradient descent and, and a set of like simulated annealing steps and so on. This is quite, quite expensive. Um, and it tries to, to mimic physics. Um, but and and for for years that was the best that we could do really right because like we were accumulating data and then so there wasn't a, a good scenario for machine learning and there were many attempts to solve portions of the problem to sp solve some very specific questions using machine learning and machine learning has been tremendously successful and helpful in that and actually indispensable in many of those sap tasks uh, contributing to the larger problem but the was, situation was never ripe to really address this uh, and like a full using a full-blown machine learning based framework and that was until late last year when uh, DeepMind uh, which is uh, part of Google now, uh, they approached this task uh, with a team of 12 Google engineers. They cranked the problem. Uh, and uh, we, the, the news broke back in uh, like early, uh, early, uh, early this year. And what DeepMind did, and they called this alpha fold, is that they actually sp split the problem into, uh, into multiple machine learning tasks. So, so starting from a sequence, uh, they learn not, they learn distances between different residues and you can actually do that right now because we've got the, enough data and mass to actually train a neural network to do that. They also learn angles between different residues and the protein and then they learn, actually they learn physics also. So they don't have Kind of knowledge-based potentials that's been developed, they actually relearn the actual potential that should act on those uh, on those distance and angle angle predictions uh, every time with every sequence, and then they just use a gradient descent algorithm to actually uh, embed all those sources of information into a single framework and predict the structure. And well, here's the kicker. So. As I said here on this slide, it takes around 10 to 20,000 20, CPU hours per, per single domain. And with this machine learning based approach, you can achieve the same thing within four or five CPU hours. So that is a very, very significant gain. Uh, and uh, since then, uh, uh, other similar methods have been actually published. One of them called the DMP fold, developed by uh, the lab of my uh, PhD supervisor. Um, that it kind of bases on a similar approach. And the nice feature of those methods is that they really are not or as accurate as those old school simulation based Techniques. So roughly speaking, 75% of the time, 80% of the time, they are right. And the main benefit for it is that they're orders of magnitude faster than old methods. Um, so on top of that, I had three sleep sleepless nights when I learned about this. Actually, it's great because now the problem what took us over two years to predict 200,000, it is we're able, we will be able to actually predict all the microbial proteins that yeah, we're interested in within a year, not even using the grid, just a single computing cluster. So uh, all in all, uh, it's great news and it will give us access to a lot more data and a lot more information. And uh, so just one last thing I really want to mention, right? So I said structure determines function, and this is why we are so excited about learning about all of those different structures of microbial proteins. Um, and actually, me and my collaborators, uh, we developed recently uh, a method, 
that's also deep learning based that takes advantage of this so from biology we knew that this is true but like can we use can we actually put it within an algorithmic framework to prove that it, this is this is the case so what we're doing is we're using graph convolutional networks uh, to encode the structure uh, as, a, as a graph and then we're using an LSTM uh, language model to encode the sequence and then we're using a graph convolutional network to predict the function of a protein and as compared to kind of standard methods in gray we're doing way way better uh, than it was it was uh, the case so far and and this improvement that we're getting through the use of structure is actually the same as we were using uh, an experimentally solved structure versus a predicted computationally generated structure. And here is this comparison to a black line is, a predict is, a, is an experimental structure and the red line is the structure coming from a DMP fold algorithm. So this is the one that the deep learning based algorithm so we're getting an improvement over, over just the sequence based. Uh, so we're moving towards that. We're hoping to get there as we'll have this rich resource of different functions uh, corresponding to micros. We'll hope to, to bridge this gap to go from 50% way beyond that uh, so that we can actually uh, better understand what those microbes do and then the hope is that equipped with this knowledge we'll be able to uh, actually start designing microbiome based um, microbiome based uh, therapies or therapeutic strategies uh, of course a lot of people worked on that and a lot more will work on that uh, so with that I'd like to thank you and Take more questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have two questions. One is that uh, how does it work uh, if you want to, for example, uh, have, have the deep mind solve some problem, then someone from chemistry, physics, biology just up, up, uh, approaches them and says that we have a problem for you, or it's, it's their in initiative, so they have to come out with some. So how, how did it work, for example, in this case? Yeah, so in this case, as far as I know, because uh, they they were just scouting for problems that are kind of uh, real world problems because they just wanted to use the technology in something that's relevant and this is just a problem that they found like oh yes we can solve this and this is kind of like biologically relevant uh, so we want to tackle this problem so they just put a, a you know a, a team of engineers on that problem to 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 try and solve it and from what i know there was an ismb conference which is intelligent systems molecular biology it was like a major bioinformatics conference back in july and one of the head uh, researchers at DeepMind was at this conference and he was probably scouting for a new biological project. The problem is it has some limitations because it cannot really create new puzzle pieces just put together the whole picture uh, from existing bio puzzle pieces which were already found. Yeah. So I, think, I think they really took the problem for several reasons. One is like it is really well defined. It's like you know when you're doing well on this problem, right? Because like people have been working on this for many decades and like, you know, the problems and like m metrics to assess like how well you're doing, like really well established. Um, so in that sense, it's no surprise to me that they kind of decided, okay, this is worthwhile. And also like over the years, kind of the, the, the amount of data to train models on uh, has developed so much that you know they probably decided you know it's their time is ripe and then the second reason is that my um, former PhD supervisor has his office like right across the street from DeepMind and he was <laughs> consulting for them yes. yeah the second question will be that uh, you know, people are living in certain regions and they have as you said certain yeah. realms and uh, if they are not traveling there is not changing but for example let's say that i go to egypt for a week uh -huh. uh, then do i affect my microbiome for long term or short term or yes and how much you know how much influence do i have to have to have a long term this is a really really good question so uh, first part of it yes you affect your microbiome in a very significant way and actually we do have a lot of 
evidence for that. One probably best evidence is that my bo former boss, Rob Knight, he is traveling a lot and he's been sampling himself for years. So we've actually got microbiome evidence to support it. Um, and then answering the second question, is, and I think it's the same as with antibiotics. So. After taking antibiotics, some people recover within a week or two to go back to the original microbiome. For some people, it takes months to do so. And there's still a small percentage of people that never go back to their initial kind of microbiome composition. Is it bad? I, 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 don't, have, I don't have the data to answer that. I, I don't think it's necessarily bad, but for sure, it teaches us that we should be very, very cautious about the use of antibiotics anyway, right? Uh, it's not only antibiotic resistance that's now kind of becoming more of a problem, but it's also like affecting, potentially affecting your microbiome in an irreversible way. Couldn't we, for example, use antibiotics to strengthen the microbiome against antibiotics? So like a small dose is when you are healthy, to make your microbiome stronger when you are sick, we use a bigger dose to kill the, the bad bacteria, but you know, those who are good. In principle, yes, but it, right. But as you just, like the last part of your sentence, it's like, it's impossible because like bacteria transfer the resistance genes or like still steal the resistance genes from one another. So generally developing more antimicrobial resistance it doesn't work like, okay, we're gonna teach the good guys to like be my antibiotics resistant and the bad guys will like die off. It's, it's not the case and it's also oftentimes not the case that there are good guys and there are bad guys. It's just anything, like it is about a composition, right? Like if there's, there are too many of the good guys and they like team up together, they can become the bad guys. So, you know, it's not as obvious. Like we've got specific pathogens that we know we want to fight, but there's, you know, a lot of the microbiome related problems are due to, you know, imbalance in the microbiome. Yes? Um, let me just have um, the data that you collected, so the map that you showed. Uh, what type of, um, let's say, metadata that it, it contains, or demographic data maybe, so that, I mean, if you, if you actually measure or want to assess the diversity of microbiomes across populations, right. then, uh, I mean, do you only have, like, geographical location of their ages, or, you know, or their sexes, or of the, of the people, or you actually know that for the last five years they've taken this and this antibiotics, or they've tried to... Yeah, well... So, so, yeah. Well, metadata, uh, this is a very loaded question. I'll try to answer this to the best of my ability. Oh, metadata is uh, its own science in, in its own right, of course. We try to, in Cheetah, we try to adhere to the MEMARCs metadata requirements but you know overall we just require very minimal metadata to deposit anything into the database so now it depends on the specific researcher what they actually deposit there and uh, the reason for this is that we want to encourage as many people to upload their data uh, as possible uh, so we don't want our requirements to be very stringent with that being said this kind of the minimal metadata that we expect for most human associated studies are the basic demographic variables. So like country of origin, country of residence, uh, ethnicity, age, sex, BMI. Uh, on top of that, there are studies that have a very meticulous and detailed metadata ranging from like all the biomarkers, like medication, antibiotic usage. Uh, but there are also studies that have very minimal uh, sets of this data. So it is really, really difficult uh, to aggregate studies on a large scale. One reason being that there is this different levels of metadata that is being collected and the other uh, other reason being that people are ter terrible when it comes to adhering to standards if you don't like because like if you have very stringent requirements like your database is going to be sane and like you can merge everything it's like you always know that you know it's lowercase age and not something else but then you uh, 
present a hurdle for people to actually upload this data and like you don't want to do it because like you want as many people as possible to contribute to this repository. Uh, so then there is an issue of actually reconciling all of that, right? Because like height, like is very, you know, people, people's height, like in a very, very simple uh, metadata, but like, you know, some people uh, do it in centimeters, some people do it in meters, some people do it in inches and different units and all of that. And like not everyone actually deposits what the unit is and so on. So there, there's a lot of issues doing, doing kind of meta analyses across different studies coming from different labs. Uh, yeah, and I think latitude and longitude is like also what we require and uh, and some basic kind of experimental information. But this is like literally probably like five different like columns of metadata to be deposited into Cheetah. Um, yeah, so it is a very kind of like a long lasting problem uh, that I think is one of the most difficult problems to actually to resolve, like how to, how to do this so that it's easy for people to deposit it and that it's kind of easy to manage <coughs> And then uh, you know perform certain analyses. Like we have, we have kind of layers of software living on top of Cheetah to try and actually uh, crawl through Cheetah and then like infer different metadata uh, and so on. Uh, but this is this is there is a lot of inferred data. And then we have do we also do have actually tools that help people generate metadata in a consistent way. Um, but yeah. I hope that answers your question. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned this, this new method to predict the structure from the sequence you know, with accuracy like 75%. Sounds like a miracle in this discipline. Yeah? And I wonder what, what do you really mean by this accuracy? I mean, on how many proteins it was tested? Yeah? Because yeah. as far as I know, it's not so many structures that are sold per year. Yeah. Uh, and this, 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 this year uh, announcement, yeah? Yeah. So, so on how many structures? Is right. <laughs> Uh, so, so AlphaFold, the DeepMinds method, they took part in CASP, which is like kind of yeah, yeah. every two years there's a competition, and it clearly outperformed everyone, uh, AlphaFold. Uh, so for proteins with, so this is an experiment where different groups are being given the task to solve the structure of a protein that is because yeah, it's, it's, it's a hundred proteins okay. usually okay. so so it's not a very thorough um, evaluation and then obviously people do a lot of kind of uh, temporal holdout kind of validations right so they split like a test set tra training set is like everything solved until 2016 and then like from 2016 to 2019 this is my my test set and, and so on uh, and actually what we're doing because like we don't trust this validation is like what we're doing is we're actually running DMP fold which is publicly available on all the 200,000 structures that we predicted uh, because like we already have the results coming from our Rosetta simulations uh, and then we want to actually compare like what are the biases in the MP fold and other like deep learning based uh, yeah, prediction I methods. I would expect that there are some kind of proteins that are harder to yeah, of course. Uh, crystallize so there's also less data on them. So that Absolutely. This particular Absolutely. I mean, and, 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 and this is... Understand what would we recover with this method. Yeah, so, so, so and, and, and just to answer that, answer that 75%, so, so uh, I didn't say that explicitly, but we, we only attempt to predict structures of proteins that have enough kind of data, enough sequence data on them. So everything that we try to predict, so that has a like, large enough gene family, uh, we are 75% sure that the prediction of this is going to be correct. And by correct, I mean have cast the same fold as uh, as the actual experimental structure of a protein. Okay, I think we had a few questions, and I think it's time to thank Tomek for this great seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>